From our egg-laying ancestors, three branches of mammals have emerged. The first are the monotremes, who still lay eggs for some reason. The second is the placentals, who hatch their eggs internally and grow them in there for a very long time, only releasing them once they're more or less done. The third branch of mammals have perhaps the highest expectations of any parents. After just two to four weeks of internal growth, their babies have to make their own way out of the birth canal, climb up into their mother's pouch, and even make their own beds once they get there. So it's hardly a surprise that kangaroos ended up becoming some of the toughest herbivores in all of Australia. But there were once even tougher roos. The gigantic Procoptodon once towered over its rivals, armed with a terrifying kick and a bite designed for wood. This exceptionally tolerant animal was the largest kangaroo that ever lived, but one day, like so many others, it disappeared. In this video, we're discussing how Procoptodon came to be, what made it so freakishly human, and why all of a sudden it was gone. And stick around, because we'll offer a chilling warning about why Australian marsupials might be worth worrying about a lot more than the snakes and spiders. First, a bit of history. Mammals, as we recognize them today, emerged around the late Triassic. This actually happened to be a terrible time to be a mammal, as it was about the same time dinosaurs started becoming dominant. They, like everything else, didn't just pop into existence, but evolved from a sort of warm-blooded reptilian-adjacent group of animals called cynodonts. Technically, we're still cynodonts, and the only such remaining of our kind. At some point, though, one branch of ancestral cynodonts took off to become mammals, and they apparently did quite a good job of it, too, because all the non-mammalian cynodonts, who'd once filled a multitude of predatory and herbivorous niches, went extinct almost immediately afterwards. Cynodonts were egg layers, and while the vast majority of mammals ditched this idea in favour of far more laborious parental care, monotremes, to this day, carry that strategy with them. But monotremes are weird, so we'll gloss over them for this video and focus on the Therian mammals. These are the mammals that give birth without laying an egg, and they're grouped into the placentals and the marsupials. Unlike monotremes, both give birth to live young, but marsupials do it a lot sooner than placentals, which actually made them more successful in some locations than their eutherian cousins, particularly in South America. But the Cretaceous extinction event seemed to affect marsupials more than placentals, and the ratio has flipped significantly since then. By that time, marsupials had migrated from South America across Antarctica and into Australia. You can unfortunately no longer make that walk, at least without getting very wet. But it used to be a lot easier, as those continents were part of the supercontinent Gondwana, and although by this time it was already starting to break up, with just a little bit of rafting the crossing was still possible. Today 70% of marsupials are found in Australia, having uniquely withstood the competition from placentals in no small part by being isolated by vast amounts of water and sharks. And almost all of the remaining 30% still live in South America, where they've held their own and their original turf. Placentals outcompeted them almost everywhere else, but on this particular continent-sized island, there are no native placentals at all. Even dingoes, a breed of wild dog, appear to have been brought over by humans as recently as four or five thousand years ago, and these have since become naturalized. So by the end of the Pleistocene, Australia was already a bizarre museum of ancient wonders. Even today, kangaroos are the world's most diverse group of herbivorous marsupials, but during the Pleistocene, they were at their peak. They were filling niches occupied by ungulates pretty much everywhere else, and as we'll see, they grew to epic proportions, along with many other animals. In Australia, much like almost everywhere else, the Pleistocene was the height of ancient mammalian megafauna. While Europe was being flattened by herds of mammoth and North America was covered in blood from all the saber-toothed tigers everywhere, Australia was throwing out its own eccentricities. The giant monitor wizard Megalania roamed the lands, and wombats taller than people defended their young against marsupial lions and three-metre-tall chickens known as thunderbirds. So Procoptodon was in good company as far as giant freaks go. And giant kangaroo certainly goes a long way to sum up this animal, as that is more or less what it would have looked like, but with a few caveats. First, they weren't all giant. There are perhaps eight identified species from fossils, and the smallest of these was only a meter tall, so only half the size of the largest roos around today. But the biggest known species, Procoptodon golia, stood 2.7 meters tall and could have weighed up to 240 kilograms. 
And we're about to go into why this may have been its downfall, but before we cover that, let's look at some of the differences in this genus to modern-day kangaroos and take a moment to gently remind you that every like and subscribe that we get helps us grow this channel, so please take the time to if you're enjoying the video. Procoptodon had several features that would have made it funny looking to us now, even for a kangaroo. This was a genus in the subfamily of macropods called Thenuridae, or short-faced kangaroos. These guys were around in Australia at the same time as modern kangaroos, but they took a little bit of a different path. Short and long faces are still a matter of debate in zoology, but it's looking like they relate to feeding strategies, as longer noses can help animals reach into narrower spaces to find food, and shorter ones allow for a stronger bite force. Procoptodon had a much, much shorter face than most mammals of its size, certainly of any kangaroo, and this wouldn't be the only feature that it would have in common with the human settlers, who would soon come to leave their mark on this land. Wider hip bones, often somewhat resembling those in humans, suggest this marsupial might have carried a substantial quantity of junk in its trunk. Large and powerful buttocks like this imply an adaptation to walking, something kangaroos aren't traditionally known for. It could be that a shorter range of habitat allowed Procoptodon to abandon hopping as a means of getting around, and it might have been this that led to the gigantism of the larger species in the first place. A kangaroo's biggest Procoptodon, Goliath, may not have been able to hop even if it wanted to, and a lot of fossils suggest the animal moved around in a similar way to that of a human. Bones on the foot show a tendency to walk on the tips of their toes, maybe not quite so much like a human, but more so than other kangaroos. And all of this amounts to what might have been a very large, hoofed, and probably lumbering animal with a painful bite. And this mouth was eerily familiar too. The teeth of this large kangaroo are strikingly similar to those of one of our ancient human relatives, Paranthropus boisei. The teeth of Procoptodon galaya suggest that it was a browser, rather than a grazer like today's kangaroos, and it would have been able to tolerate tougher leaves and stems than most, the kinds of things found in arid and semi-arid environments. To further aid in feeding, Procoptodon would have also used another distinctly human-like feature, hands. Marsupials and primates traditionally use hands for a very similar reason. Even a human baby has a surprising amount of grip strength from birth and a reflex known as the palmar grasp reflex. This is a throwback to our hairier ancestors whose babies would have held onto their fur as the parents were moving around through the branches. Marsupials, being born tiny and almost embryonic, use theirs to clamber out of the birth canal like a haunted doll and work their way up their mother's fur into the pouch, where they can continue to mature for many months after. So while mammalian forelimbs diversified into hooves, flippers and trotters, marsupials pretty much all have hands, or close enough to it. So Procoptodon was potentially a bipedal, flat-faced browser, with long arms, dexterous hands, and could handle some pretty tough food sources, including what appeared to be its favorite food, saltbush. Isotopic analyses into Procoptodon teeth also imply that this animal was able to drink more water in arid environments than its contemporaries, and this would have no doubt been to counter all of the salt in its diet, but it also throws a spanner in the works of a lot of other inferences about this animal. Perhaps Procoptodon was gifted with salt glands, allowing it to take in more water from its salty food than other animals could, or perhaps it wasn't as sedentary as some of the fossils suggest and could move between water sources. The debate around Procoptodon's locomotive abilities continues to this day, and it's far from settled, but with Procoptodon galaya standing almost three meters tall, it was surely a force to be reckoned with, so what would have been able to frighten the largest kangaroo the world has ever seen? Modern kangaroos have some understated defenses, not least the ability to spring up and land a kick with a powerfully clawed pair of feet to the gut. They also box, which is comical to watch, but perhaps most unsettling is their ability to affix a chokehold onto their enemies, much in the way you'd apply one in BJJ or mixed martial arts. The long arms of Procoptodon would have been great for this, and its exaggerated toe bone and thick, robust lower limbs may have been able to land a hefty kick, even if they weren't good for hopping. This kangaroo could likely pack a punch, and it would have had to since the lands were covered in extinct predators like the large marsupial lions, Thylacoleo carnifex. But they must have done something right, because fossils suggest that Procoptodon golia was the most widely distributed species among all of the Pleistocene macropods throughout the continent, owing in no small part to its extreme diet. 
but by around 40 or 45,000 years ago, Procoptodon, along with 90% of all large kangaroo species, went extinct. Why was this? One thing that Procoptodon didn't have in common with humans was the ability to make fire. Humans had figured this out long before they arrived in Australia, and by this time they were using it more or less willy-nilly. As destructive as it is, fire is excellent at driving game into or out of areas strategically. It's also good for making spaces where trees once were, or otherwise cutting a path through impenetrable forests. Dense forest gradually became partial forest, partial became open, and open became grassland, and the plant diversity shifted towards species that could withstand burning cycles better. Lots of animals that specialized in anything else would have struggled to adapt in time to the new selection of food, and this could have been a likely contributor to their extinction. But as we mentioned, Procoptodon was a saltbush specialist, and not only is that hard to say, it's also hard to set fire to, as these plants are not very flammable. There were also the characteristic climate effects of the late Pleistocene to consider, but being well suited to an arid environment, and the fact that its disappearance seems to coincide with a period of climatic stability, suggests that this was less likely than our final option, which is a lot harder to swallow. Us. Within about 4,000 years of the arrival of a competing bipedal short-nosed mammal, Procoptodon appears to have left our world for good. Some evidence points to a lingering population as recently as 18,000 years ago, but this has yet to be fully accepted. If the genus was indeed less able to move long distances, it would have made it significantly easier to hunt, though none of the fossils found so far show evidence of human interference. Today, even with 90% of their kind missing, kangaroos are still the most diverse group of herbivorous marsupials, and they represent a lingering presence in a world that, for now, favors placentals. But with the climate entering unprecedented uncertainty, this might not be the case for long. Traditionally, people have looked at marsupials as lesser mammals, more primitive, a bit old-fashioned, and altogether not as good. But as our understanding of ecology and evolution expand, we are faced with an abruption from our placental biases, and new insights are shining a light on the hidden strengths of the marsupial breeding strategy. In a world with a lot of environmental instability, lower gestation times can be a huge advantage. And conversely, having such a vulnerable and interdependent link between mother and fetus can often mean that losing one results in the loss of the other as well. There's a substantially lower investment in marsupial reproduction, and this means lower risks, and therefore more opportunities to get one out during trying times. So as we consider the infamous island with its terrifying and dangerous animals, it might be worth sparing a thought for the world's largest ever kangaroo. And while you're at it, give a nod to its surviving relatives, the marsupials, who are still very much there, just waiting for their time to rise again. That's all for this video. Thanks again for watching.